Thank you so much for joining us today. In today's episode, we are talking about income loss as a direct result of an accident. A lot of people might think that they don't have an income loss because they continue to work. Uh, they're not off of work for an extended period of time. Oftentimes that's not necessarily true. So what you're getting at is income loss doesn't mean complete disability, complete inability to work. You can still have a valid claim for an income loss, even if you return to work. Yes. It's always a challenge for clients because sometimes it takes time to resolve the case. And in the interim, if somebody's not working, that can be a huge financial stress on them and put pressure on us as lawyers to try to resolve the case as quickly as possible. But sometimes resolving a case quickly isn't the best way to maximize the recovery. So in personal injury cases, if somebody's working at the time of the accident and they sustain a significant enough injury that keeps them off of work, they're obviously entitled to advance a claim for both their past and their future income loss. Past income loss represents that income that's lost from the date of the accident until the conclusion of the case, whether that's by settlement or if it's a trial verdict. Future income loss is the projection of what they would have made if the accident didn't occur, for example. Right. There might be future income loss in cases where the individuals have difficulty with working. They require accommodations at work, such as modified duties, modified hours. You know, that in itself is is known as income loss in general that right. a lawyer can advance. Right. And also if somebody is at a disadvantage in the open labor market, maybe they can't get the promotions they otherwise would have, the career advancements they were planning on pursuing. They retire earlier than expected, for example. Yeah. We calculate that based on the information we have in terms of their income earning capacity, their education, their training, their experience. But also, very often, we have to employ experts. If there's an income loss claim for the future, what kind of experts would we need? First and foremost, uh, we might hire a vocational expert to determine um, what the other possibilities of work or employment that the individual can work as a direct result of an accident that they sustain um, because their current work, maybe it's too physical in labor. These vocational experts would you know, assess the individual's education, experience, um, their age, etc., and determine what are the other possible avenues of employment that this individual might have in the future. Yeah, if any, or in the case of a really significant injury that disables them from working, their conclusion might be that this person isn't capable of working in any capacity based on their training experience and based on the injuries sustained. Okay, so that opinion gives you an opinion on their working capacity, but then how do you actually calculate the income loss? The future income loss, um, we basically use what the individual was making prior to the accident, and we use that as their projection into the future. For example, accounting for inflation raises, accounting for promotions that they might get. Right, and again, in those circumstances, depending on the case, sometimes we again need to employ experts, this time in the form of forensic accountants to do the math on what's called a present value basis or an economist to give us a present value of their future losses, not just for future income loss, but, but any other loss like future healthcare expenses. Present value takes into account the fact that you may be getting money that would have been paid out periodically over the next 20 or 30 years, but you're getting it in a lump sum and therefore there's a discount rate applied, right? So if somebody would have worked till age 65, but they're settling at age 40, that's gonna be reduced to account for the present value. What about the person that isn't that obvious? They've returned to their previous job, they're earning more or less the same amount of money, but they're telling you as their lawyer, it's more difficult at work now. Before this accident, I had all these aspirations, maybe even get a promotion. Although I'm still earning the same amount of money, I'm just not as efficient at work. I'm not as effective at work. My coworkers don't like me as much because they gotta, they gotta help me with a, a lot of overflow. I'm just not the same employee. And I'm worried about what my employer thinks of me. I'm worried about my manager. I'm worried I might lose my job. How do you present that kind of case where on paper, 
it's clear the insurance company is going to say, well, there's no income loss because they're still at work and they're still earning the same amount of money. The basis of this income loss isn't particular, you know, isn't specifying that they, as a direct result of the accident, they can't go back to work. But then the argument is because of this accident, this individual loss, you know, different uh, opportunities at work. They would have made more overtime. They would have uh, applied for a promotion, not missed out on opportunities. All of these uh, such scenarios, for example, it does form a basis of income loss. With this type of income loss, um, it's very important to let the doctors know about your ongoing difficulty with uh, certain tasks or certain physical labors, for example. It's important to let the doctor know that you're having all these ongoing issues so that, you know, maybe the doctor would recommend some sort of accommodations at work, modified duties like light duties, and not allowing the individual to lift heavier than 20 pounds, for example, right. lesser hours in a day, for example. And what would you say to someone that they're okay to report that to their doctor, but as much as they're struggling at work, they don't want their employer or their coworkers to know that they're struggling because they're afraid of losing the job. I would suggest to still report it to their doctors at the very least. If they don't bring it up to their employers, for example, at least the doctor knows that they're having these ongoing issues and it's documented somewhere uh, within the clinical notes and records. Yeah. And I would also suggest to those people, despite your best efforts to hide it, the chances are if their injuries are impacting their performance at work, people probably already see it. In fact, you might have a better chance of keeping your job if your coworkers and your managers and your employer actually understood where you're coming from. I've had clients in the past um, that tell me a lot of the times that their employers are actually very sympathetic and they actually assist them in you know providing accommodations so that they can continue working uh, within their capacity as well yeah. and i think employers are also many employers would appreciate that this individual is continuing to work and continuing to put forth as much effort as possible to be there every day it then allows us as lawyers if needed now we have someone we can speak to most cases where there is some sort of income loss component it's very, very beneficial to us lawyers to get a statement from the individual's manager, the individual's co-workers, so that we can inquire with some about how the individual's working before the accident and as a result of the accident, even when they return back to work, what are the difficulties they are facing? What are some things that they, sh they see the individual lacking or uh, has changed uh, as a result of trying to compensate their ongoing physical or mental injury? Those statements, those where you're referring to, those will say statements or before and after lay witness statements, particularly like an employer that knew this person before the accident and after, can really help a lot in terms of demonstrating to the insurance company the real risk of income loss. Now, all of a sudden, what appeared on the surface to be there's no income loss, now all of a sudden the, the insurance company has, has a much greater risk of having to pay for future income loss. Okay, this is all fine and dandy for us advancing the case, but as you know, that could take months or sometimes years. What happens to the person at home because they're so injured they can't work? You know, we're fighting to try to get them their income loss. How do they survive? There is some insurance, maybe personal insurance, um, that the individual has for not working at the time or there might be uh, some government subsidies or government programs uh, that assist individuals that are disabled to get some uh, monthly income, let's call it, uh, to assist them in uh, their everyday life. We do have clients that the financial hardship is a big emotional stress to people after an accident, particularly where it's no fault of their own. They were able to earn a living before, and then because of someone's negligence, they can't earn a living, they can't pay their bills, and I think sadly, some insurance companies, some adjusters, some defense lawyers, frankly, will use the time that litigation takes, I think, to continue to use that financial hardship as leverage to try to get a more favorable settlement for the insurance company. They will make offers on cases like that, but very often they're low offers because they expect that the person will have so much difficulty that irrespective of their injuries, they'll return to work. 
then the insurance company when they do return to work out of financial need and sometimes even against the advice of their doctors then the insurance company will say well you know the income loss is nowhere near as great as you were claiming for it's a tough tough position for people to be in it's a tough position for us to be in because you're trying to maximize their recovery but you also understand they have to live they have to pay their bills okay let's talk first about challenges to proving income loss because we're talking about how we do it but we do encounter challenges for instance um, individuals that have inconsistent work history lots of layoffs or dismissals in the past or they quit or there's gaps in their employment that makes it difficult to establish potential ongoing future income loss based on the issues that we're, we just talked about. We try to get a snapshot of time and say, okay, despite the fact maybe there was gaps in employment or sporadic employment, hopefully we can find a trend that they were moving upward or... Or they, they were basically already en route to go to their more permanent position. Again, statements from their family members people who knew them best, describing sort of what their plans were. or And the thing that they were doing to achieve those future career goals, for example. Right. Like, were they taking classes? Maybe it was sporadic because they, because they were in university in the past. I think the key is getting behind the surface. So on the surface, it might look like sporadic employment, but like you said, it could be because of their age. It could be because they haven't found a career they, they really love. So it's kind of getting behind that and finding the information and then figuring out how to communicate that information to the insurance company, to the defense lawyers. Another sometimes challenging uh, employment loss case are those with self-employed individuals. And you know, if they have a business, it's harder to tell what their income loss is. A self-employed individual who's a contractor, for example, they can't do their own work. As a result, they had to hire additional employees to do the work. You know, statements from employees, their colleagues, it narrates why there's an income loss, even though it might not show on paper. Do you think that someone still has a case if they don't have an income loss? A lot of the times when individuals are in fact injured they and they go back to work without any accommodations or anything like that, they still have other claims that they can have, you know, for pain, there's pain and suffering losses. There's other economic losses, such as out-of-pocket expenses. So even if the individual does not officially have an income loss, um, you know, th there's still other damages that can be sought after in a claim. We hope you enjoyed this uh, conversation where we talk about income loss following an accident or injury. If you have any questions in relation to a claim that you might have, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our details are listed in the show notes below. Thank you.